third speaker today is Ying Zhang from John Hopkins, and now we're going to talk about a, a different drug, an old drug, clofazamine, and novel mutations associated with resistance. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for the opportunity to give this presentation. So I'm going to talk about uh, novel mutations associated with uh, clofazamine resistance. As we all know, clofazamine, in fact, uh, is an old drug. It was uh, first discovered in 1957 by Vincent Berry uh, from Ireland. Uh, so when he first identified this drug, he was developing this drug with the mind to uh, as a TB drug, right? But unfortunately, uh, as a TB drug, it wasn't very effective in animal model. Uh, but then, you know, a researcher at NIH called uh, Y.T. Zhang in 1959, sh shortly after, found it had uh, activity against uh, murine leprosy. So fairly early on, in fact, a few years after its discovery, it's being tested as a leprosy drug. In the early 60s, there were clinical studies done in Nigeria, in, in African countries, uh, as a leprosy drug. So right now, as we all know, it's being primarily used as a drug for treating leprosy in combination with rifampin and dapsone. And clofazamine is really an interesting drug because uh, primarily active against mycobacterial species, have activity against uh, both growing, slow growing, and the fast growing mycobacteria, and also has some activity against the gram positive bacteria like Staph aureus. Uh, so it may have some use for treating MRSA. It has variable, for M tuberculosis, clofazamine in fact is quite active. And the MIC can be quite low, and uh, different labs report somewhat different MICs Based on our experience, the MIC is uh, below 0 0.25 microgram per mL. Other labs use one microgram per mL as a cutoff for resistance. But we think it has to do with the methodology for susceptibility testing. And its activity for other mycobacteria is sort of more variable, may not be as active as for tuberculosis. The drug itself is actually when you use it alone, it's not very active. It's more like a static drug. It shows more activity in combination with other drugs. Uh, its activity from static can become bactericidal if you use higher concentration, and also in combination with other drugs, even showing sterilizing activity in combination with other drugs. Very interesting study by, done by uh, TB Alliance and. Uh, Ganges uh, diagram where there's uh, no EBA in humans, two week EB study. Clofazamine has absolutely no activity. It's really quite intriguing, you know, unlike other TB drugs. Well, perhaps the only other exception is parazinamide. It doesn't really have very good EBA. So cl clofazamine is like that. So it's, it's a drug that's really quite interesting, has activity against the growing form as well as same activity against the persister forms. It's a terrible drug to work with because <laughs> we all know it's very difficult to dissolve. Even you use organic solvent, DMSO, alcohol, and all that, it doesn't really work. So trying to study the drug in terms of mechanism of action is very difficult. You have to dissolve it into su sufficiently high concentration in order to test the drug binding and all that. That's very difficult, made the study very difficult. And the side effect is this uh, you know, brownish uh, skin discoloration which, as we all know, and the in vivo, it's very interesting. It's actually fat soluble. It accumulates in fat tissues as well as uh, in different organs. Uh, as the time goes on, then you get the increasingly high drug concentration accumulated in the tissue. The half life of the drug is about 70 days, pretty long. So this is a study done by uh, Cliff Berry and also uh, Veronique uh, Dartois, in terms of uh, drug penetration in relation to sterilizing activity of the drug. It's interesting to notice that uh, PZD and INH 
they seem to get into the lesions, the caseous lesions quite well, but not clofazamine. It doesn't really quite get into the cavity, the caseous lesions, but it does accumulate inside the cells, inside macrophages, intracellularly. So it may be, in this sense, good for intracellular infections, like the murine TB, but perhaps for human, when the organism primarily extracellular or in cavities, its activity may be somewhat compromised. The recent interest in clofazamine is all started from this Bangladesh trial, which I must say is very smart, because the, the people who did the trial considered the location and the, the ethnicity of the population, because the side effect of clofazamine can well be hidden. You can't see that, because the color of the, <laughs> I think this, this is very smart and really shown that MDRTB therapy, which otherwise is 18 to 24 months, can now be cured with nine months regimen containing clofazamine. So this is actually a four month initial treatment with canamycin clofazamine, C for clofazamine, gadifloxacin, ethambutol, uh, high dose INH, and PZA plus pro, uh, prothanamide. Then followed by five months of a continuation phase still containing clofazamine. So you get a cure rate about 83%, which is pretty high, uh, almost like a drug susceptible TB. And in comparison to the background regimen of the WHO regimen, only 48% cure rate. And since then, the, this study results have been replicated in, at different sites, uh, including South Africa, China, and in the Chinese trial, which was published last year, addition of clofazamine led to 74% cure in comparison to 54% control regimen in the MDR trial. And they do see uh, sooner clearance of the sputum culture, uh, sputum conversion, as well as uh, cavity closure. Clofazamine has been shown to shorten therapy in MDR uh, drug regimen in a mouse model by uh, Neumberger from Johns Hopkins, as well as for shortening TB treatment in the drug susceptible TB by Jacques Rosset, also from Johns Hopkins. So as you can see, Hopkins has a lot of interest in this particular drug, which I think is quite interesting. So this is a study done by Grosset's lab where he was comparing this uh, standard regimen with a two months INH, rifampin, PCD, ethambutol, followed by four months RH. And then here he replaced this ethambutol with clofazamine. And also in the continuation phase of two months, he added clofazamine. With this four months treatment, he was able to demonstrate this clofazamine containing regimen can shorten the treatment from six months to three months. Okay. So how does the drug work? It's actually very intriguing. Unlike uh, common antibiotics, inhibit the cell wall or protein or nucleic acid synthesis, it doesn't do any of these. And, uh, it actually Vincent Berry, when he first discovered this drug, he first proposed that it could serve as a recycling, uh, re redox recycling agent where it can produce reactive oxygen species. This has been substantiated more recently by uh, Harvey Rubin's lab at UPenn. And then the second theory is that clofazamine has activity on the membrane. Uh, this could be very important. In fact, we found, along with others, that membrane is a very good site for positive drugs. It's very important. So clofazamine had this property of acting on the membrane so that it can cause membrane dysfunction and may, from there, can cause energy depletion. Also, another study showed actually by uh, Norman Morrison from Johns Hopkins uh, who was working on leprosy he found that clofazamine may actually bind DNA as a possible mechanism of action in the 1970s. Clofazamine also has this uh, effect on the host. Uh, it has anti-inflammatory and immune suppressive effect. 
that is well known. It's uh, shown to stimulate the activity of macrophages, as well as uh, pr producing increased uh, reactive oxygen species, causing increased uh, apoptosis, uh, and a reduced activity of neutrophils. That's a more recent study from India that is somewhat intriguing, where they showed that clofazamine inhibits this TB secreted TB protein, which otherwise is actually secreted into the macrophages. They interfere with host macrophage um, actin um, reorganization, as well as uh, interfere with uh, MAP kinase uh, singling pathway, as well as NF kappa B. Uh, but somehow uh, they showed that clofazamine inhibits this process. But this cannot be said to have uh, to be related to its mode of action uh, of the drugs. That's not the basis for killing the TB organism, but rather it's actually a host modulating effect. I mean, this is actually interfering with mycobacterial host modulating effect. So in terms of its resistance, um, how, how much of, how, how am I doing with the time? <laughs> So this is the part I think uh, for this audience uh, this, uh, people are interested in knowing. But in fact, the drug is fairly new. It's uh, not really that commonly used for treating MDR. It's only just starting now. People are just beginning to notice resistance. And uh, there aren't that many clinical isolates to look at. So we, instead, people started looking at in vitro generated mutants resistant to clofazamine. So the first gene identified is the RV0678, uh, discovered by Stuart Cole's group as well as more or less same time by Kong Andrews group when they were looking at uh, uh, bidaculin resistance. In fact, this single gene mutation caused cross resistance to both clofazamine as well as bidaculin. So this is quite interesting. What is the gene's function? It serves as a transcription repressor for efflux protein. So when you, when you the gene acquires mutations, especially uh, stop codon mutations or out of frame mutations, then the complete inactivation of the repressor, you get higher expression of the efflux pump. Uh, in addition, um, this is actually causing higher level of resistance, it looks like, in comparison to point mutations that cause only a single amino acid change that seem to cause somewhat lower level of resistance. So, yeah, we actually, when uh, we, uh, we analyzed uh, about uh, close to 100 uh, clofazamine resistant mutants isolated in vitro. So we did all the sequencing and found that, yeah, actually in addition to this 0678 gene, we found the two new genes involved in its resistance. So I'm going to go over this table very briefly. So. With this analysis of all the mutants resistant to clofazamine, we found that 97% is pretty high percentage having mutations in this RV0678 gene, okay? Then only about three strains that do not have mutations in this particular gene. These actually two happened in this new gene called uh, RV1979C and one in this RV2535C. It's quite interesting, this uh, RV1979C mutation, the one strain have this only single mutation. There's another two strains that has, in addition to this mutation, has a RV0678 mutation. So it has two mutations. So if you look at the mutation size, it's uh, quite interesting, about uh, three to four hot spots. Uh, one at uh, this uh, G193, uh, this seemed to be a hot spot. And all the others pretty well scattered along gene, reminding us about this uh, PNC mutations, right? This is pretty scattered, uh, diverse. <coughs> so what do these two genes do? So this uh, RV1979C is, is a possible permease involved in transport of amino acid but in this case could well be a transporter for clofazamine, for clofazamine to come into mycobacteria, may go through this permease. This actually explains, which I'll come to, 
that mutations in this gene cause cross resistance as well. Okay, so in a way, we identified a new gene that's actually involved in entry of both drugs into mycobacteria. That seems to be the case, uh, but of course, more studies need to be validated. Then the other gene, then we don't know the function very well. If you look at the annotation, it says a peptidase, a PEPQ. Okay. Mutation is quite intriguing. It's a stop codon mutation. Completely inactivate the gene function. It looks like it may be a gene product involved in drug metabolism, but we don't quite know its function yet. So because of the cross resistance, we actually looked at uh, the cross resistance of our clofazamine resistant mutants with different mutation profiles in terms of sensitivity to bidaquiline. It's really quite, quite interesting. So we were able to see the cross resistance to, uh, to beta equivalent here, resistant to as high as 0.25 microgram per ml. But very interestingly, they are, even though this is cross resistance, is all susceptible to 0.5 microgram per ml. So the level of cross resistance is pretty low. Okay, so I'm going to come back to that as to whether this really has any clinical significance. Then the other one, very interestingly, this one, RV2535C mutation, is susceptible to bidacoline. No cross resistance, indicating it's a new mechanism of clofazamine resistance that does not confer bidacoline resistance. But interestingly, this RV1979C mutation actually confers cross resistance. So it grow up up to 0.25 microgram per ml. So coming back to the significance of these uh, cross resistances, uh, these are pretty low level. Okay, if you look at the Cmax, the drug concentration in the blood, they actually the level of resistance is pretty fall within that or close to the Cmax value. So this raises the question whether such mutations causing this low level resistance really have any clinical impact at all. But at this time, we don't quite know. Okay, so this really uh, worth for the study. Uh, this slide just essentially shows the different genes identified involved in resistances as well as the potential mechanism of action. So I'm going to move on to conclusions and future directions. So clofazamine, we know, is actually a promising drug that can potentially shorten treatment for both drug susceptible and the drug resistant TB. And uh, it's on its own, its activity is somewhat weak, uh, but its activity can be enhanced in combination with some drugs and can even show sterilizing activity. Mode of action is pretty complex, it looks like. It seems to have multiple effects on TB bacteria. And the target at this time is unknown. And in terms of this resistance, mutations in this gene, RV0678, is a predominant mechanism for clofazamine resistance. Then two other genes only account for a very small number of resistance. Then there is this cross resistance issue that conferred by now two genes. It's actually one is 0678, the other is 1979. So the 1979 could be a new permease that's involved in uptake of both drugs uh, in TB. So this, we believe this mutation information may be useful for designing molecular assays for detecting clofazamine resistance in, clin in clinical setting. So future studies apparently are needed to see whether how frequent these clofazamine resistant mutant strains develop in clinical setting and whether the low level resistance strains we see have any clinical impact affecting the treatment outcome. In addition, we would love to see the drug being modified uh, so that it's more soluble and more easier to work with as well as without this kind of a skin discoloration problem. <laughs> yeah. um, then we need to know how the drug really works and the target so that we'll be able to design better drugs than clofazamine to more effectively treat TB. So I'm going to thank people who did the work uh, in the lab, Shuo Zhang and uh, Wan Liang Shi, 
And our collaborators, Fudan University, who did a lot of sequencing for us, including some clinical isolates, which I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, thank uh, CPTR and uh, NIH AIDS Reagents Program for making bidaquiline available to us so that we'll be able to test uh, cross resistance. Very important. Thank you. So then, of course, thank NIID for providing the funding support. Thank you for your attention. In light of your uh, suggestion that it has an impact on ROS, um, w what are the side effects of the clopazamine, and um, can you, uh, what's the patient tolerance of it? Yeah, the side effect is actually, besides the skin coloration seem to be the most prominent. Others could include uh, GI tract uh, disturbance, uh, very rarely uh, central nervous system uh, problem, very rare. So, I mean, main side effect is a skin discoloration. Other than that, it's pretty good. It's pretty safe drug. But I guess it will have a problem in adoption for white population because the skin would actually uh, change, the, change the color, and uh, especially for ladies, right? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't mean. <laughs> Any other? <laughs> okay, yes, please. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. Maybe not for the last comment, but other than that. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, no, it was a, a useful presentation, and I know that this wasn't really the focus of it, but um, I was concerned to see in the Barry and D'Artois publication about the lack of penetration into cavities, and I was wondering if you, you know, still feel as optimistic about the treatment shortening potential of the drug after that. What else do you think might be needed to explore that, and if it's something that could be optimized through other analogs, or if it's something kind of intrinsic in the drug class? Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, I, I wish they'll be able to develop a newer version of the drug so that it's more easily penetrable, more easier to work with. But in terms of its use uh, in shortening TB treatment, uh, I think maybe for the earlier version. So this is why I think uh, pathology, e imaging here, uh, may be potentially important for guiding the treatment because for, you know, patients with these cavitary lesions, then the effect uh, may be somewhat compromised. Uh, but for those that don't have this kind of uh, cavitary lesions, uh, may still be uh, important for shortening the treatment. So um, I guess, you know, this is just uh, some uh, observation, but still, uh, whether or not this is this, um, poor penetration into, into the cavity, uh, to what extent uh, influence the treat outcome that still needs to be determined in, in clinical setting. Yeah, thank you. Mark. Uh, just one other comment I, I would make also with this would be um, Marco, yeah. is the, uh, the, the results that Jacques Rosé had on, on the animal model showing that it, it seemed to prevent relapse. Yeah. Um, and that was definitely one of the things from, a, a, I guess, a regimen development is having a, a drug that could prevent relapse as much as, as, it, as it did. And, and again, it goes to, again, the, the, the sort of the EBA type of trials that, that it's not really that remit is, is dropping, but it may have other functions that, that we were also wanting to, to try to conclude. Yeah. Thank you, Marcos. Yeah, this is very important. I, I didn't uh, talk about this uh, treatment, um, this relapse aspect, uh, as well as uh, its effect on this uh, Persister population, it looks like, uh, in combination with other drugs like PZD, or uh, maybe some other drugs in terms of killing uh, the persister populations more effectively. That is actually afforded uh, due to the property of clofazamine, uh, which is not afforded by other drugs. Yeah, this, this is a very good point. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, yeah, I, yeah, Bob. Yeah, so one comment, I guess, about. Um, the issue of skin discoloration and the potential for using this more widely in, in drug sensitive TB. I understand that there's interest from ACTG, for example, in, in conducting that study. And I really think people need to consider the stigmatization aspect. Uh, the skin color changes are quite striking. Skin color is not just important in white people. Uh, skin color is really important in African Americans 
uh, I mean, whether you, whether you were the slave in the field or the slave in the house depended you, on whether you were dark or really dark. Um, and uh, Francesca Conradi tells a story of one of her patients uh, who had MDR-TB and who's now back home on an outpatient therapy, uh, who was working delivering uh, pizzas, and, and, he's, and his skin is he's odd. He's a black guy. His skin is really odd now. And he says he opens the door to deliver the pizzas, and the people take it. They look at him, and they, they take the pizza, and they pay him, and they don't give him a tip anymore. And, and it really is, you, you would look across the room and you would say, huh, that person has MDR-TB, when he might or he might not. Um, but I, I think this, I think people really need to give more thought to this. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. So I wanted to get, get back to the um, question raised by uh, Erica and the whole um, issue about penetration to cavities and wonder if uh, any of the trials that have been conducted um, have stratified the outcomes uh, by the extent of disease. I don't know that they have, but because um, I, I know that in other studies we have uh, demonstrated that if you have bilateral cavitary disease, you're more likely to require longer duration of therapy to achieve the yeah. relapse-free cure rate. Um, so um, I'd be interested, uh, unfortunately I.D. Russin isn't here today, but he gave a presentation yesterday about the trials in Western African countries. Now they have over 515 patients who've received this, and the cure rates are exceeding 85% or so with MDR documented in that setting. So I'd be just curious to exhort them to stratify the outcomes by extent of disease if they have that information. Sure, yeah, this is a great comment. Uh, in fact, uh, I think this study needs to be uh, better um, designed uh, to e evaluate exactly the same problem, uh, like uh, patients with cavity, uh, you know, or versus those that do not. Uh, uh, they're all treated with clofazamine-containing regimen and see if they actually make a difference in terms of a sputum conversion and uh, cure relapse and all that, yeah. Uh, yes, over there, gentlemen. Yes, I, I thank you again for, for a great talk. I was just wondering if you could comment on the paper that was also published by John Hopkins, Eric Nuremberg's group, selecting, uh, I think, PEPQ mutants in vivo and showed cross resistance between bedaquiline and, and clofazmine. And in your case, you did not see that. I was wondering if that says something about in vivo relevance of uh, PEPQ and other mutant that you saw. Well, that's, that's something uh, I don't quite know. I think uh, we need to uh, look at that and because uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that data. So this uh, new data, that's... Uh okay. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of answering the question on at least potential toxicity. Um, clofazamine has a fairly significant or a very significant prolongation of the QT interval, which is additive with bedaquiline, and, and we showed that pretty definitively in the two-week trial with Andreas. Um, and also historically, it's interesting in MAC, when Dick Chasen added uh, clofazamine to clarithromycin, there was excessive deaths in the combination um, with clofazamine over the arm without clofazamine. So I, th I think it still requires some pretty significant, well-controlled clinical trials. Yes, I agree. Thank yeah. You know. yeah, thank you. Okay, right. I think we should.